Catan is probably the most divisive game among board gamers. You either love it or hate it, but for most of us, it holds a special place in our heart as the gateway game that got us into the hobby in the first place. So it's no surprise I've racked up more games of Catan than nearly any other game, only just beaten out by Carcassonne. But before I get into some actual gameplay tips, let's talk about luck. I would say Catan is 50% a game of luck. And that's not a criticism. After all, that's partly why it's a gateway game. Dice rolling is so integral to what most of us uh, initially thought of as board games when we got into the hobby. But while rolling two standard six-sided dice should roughly align with a normal distribution, uh, so six, seven, eight being the most common, that's frequently not how it works out over the relatively short uh, time span of a single game. Now, although I don't suggest doing this from the start, if you have played a number of games and your group finds that element of luck to be frustrating, I mean, you could just not play Catan, but also consider getting a deck of dice cards to use instead. Now, that's a set of 36 cards with the values for rolling two six-sided dice in the correct probability distribution. So even that useless uh, 12 is going to come up once over the course of 36 turns. Now you can even make yourself a DIY version of that with like three packs of dollar store cards if you want. And it means that your rolls will be over the course of a game much more statistically accurate. Check out the Board Game Geek thread on how to make your own linked in the description if you'd like to know more. But know that if you are going to do this then it may affect your chosen strategy slightly because you know for a fact that certain numbers are going to come out. So. On with some more general uh, tips on how to win Catan. Okay, so I've said that Settlers of Catan is 50% luck based. Well, if that's the case, another 40% is probably all to do with your starting locations, the game's starting state. So your initial location choice is absolutely critical and much of what follows is influenced by that early decision. So it's worth spending uh, a bit of time focusing on that. Now I'm gonna assume you know how to play Catan on a procedural level anyway. And you know that the red numbers six and eight are the most commonly rolled uh, next to the seven, the robber. So obviously you want your two settlements ideally to be on the edge of both a, seven, uh, both a six and an eight. What you may not know is that the dots underneath the numbers represent the frequency of how often that number should come up on a 2d6 roll. So on a technical level, if you're weighing up two different spots, you can sum the number of dots underneath the numbers uh, to figure out which is the technically better spot. The more dots that you have in total, the better it is statistically. Or if you have the choice of two spots and they both seem equally cool, look at the overall spread of the numbers. Generally, you want to cover all the numbers. So that means that you're gonna be getting something every dice roll, which then allows you to be as dynamic as possible with your strategy. Okay, maybe you didn't get the wheat that you wanted this round, but you did get enough wood and brick to build two roads to that new prime location and block someone else from going there. It's important to be adaptable when you're playing Catan. Don't just stick with one strategy uh, to the detriment of everything else. But that's not your only consideration because the type of resource is also critical and coming up with powerful combos is even better. So take a moment to look at the overall board and resource availability. Try to figure out which resources are going to be more in demand than others. If you only have uh, some extreme numbers on the stone, for instance, whoever holds the stone will have great bargaining power to get whatever else they want. So you should aim at the earliest opportunity to have that stone and upgrade your town to a city, which means also focusing on stone and wheat. Do not, under any circumstances, trade those away. Perhaps there's an opportunity to take an otherwise weak position that happens to have a two to one sheep port. And elsewhere on the board, you've also got a position open for a location surrounded by two sheep hexes with reasonably good numbers. Well, that right there would be a fantastic combo and essentially means you won't need to trade with others to achieve your goals. And even if the board is drowning in too many sheep, as it frequently is, you can soak those up from other people by offering your trading services. Perhaps they give you three sheep, you give them anything they want. Or even better, they give you two sheep plus something else, and then you give them back whatever they want. Find a powerful combo set of spots on the board and thoroughly abuse it. In a four-player game, 
stone and wheat is going to be the most in demand because it's only by upgrading cities that your engine will truly get warmed up. Space is going to be pretty tight. In a lower three player game, there's much more room to expand and try to get the longest roads or five towns built. So brick and wood become more important. So in terms of general gameplay tips uh, after you've chosen your starting locations, this is gonna be much shorter because like I said, the initial game state is the most important step. If you've done that right, if the dice are in your favor, then the rest of the game kind of slots into place by itself. But there are some good uh, overall strategies to follow. So don't antagonize a player by moving a robber to them if they're holding on to potential uh, knight or soldier cards. It's just asking to have it move back to your own lands on their turn and you will have achieved nothing. People can hold grudges for a long time and you may find you've started a war of retaliation that you really didn't want. On the other hand, if someone else is dumb enough to do this, see if that player then uses the card to move it back. If they don't, it's probably safe to deduce it's not a soldier card, it's more likely to be a hidden point card or some other bonus. So put that into your calculations of who's winning. Game theory plays a part here with tit for tat strategy uh, being the winner. Or in other words, be kind until someone else is mean to you and then you can be mean back to them. Just because you've rolled a seven doesn't mean you have to move the robber onto the best hex on the board. You're equally allowed to put it somewhere neutral uh, on that useless 12 space over there where it doesn't annoy anyone. On the other hand, you too should try to keep a development card in your hand at all times to make threats with. If you move that robber to me, I will put it right back again and I will put it on your most precious hex. So don't do that, put it on this guy instead, he's got nothing. Always keep an eye on what resources everyone has at any given moment. It's a little bit like card counting. So you are prepared to play the Monopoly development card if you get it. Maybe your game is so full of bricks that everyone hates them and has a hand of four bricks each by the time it gets to your turn. Or perhaps there was just a very lucrative stone throw immediately prior that means someone got six stones. Well, too bad, they're yours now. Play the Monopoly card even if you don't need that resource. Steal them all, trade them away, or just to be spiteful, trade them four to one with the bank for what you do need. But you better make sure to use them well because that right there is a real move and you're gonna get some serious shade thrown your way for at least a few turns, so you better make it worthwhile. If someone is desperate to trade with you and you think it's a fair trade, see if they'll do it on your turn instead. That way you're delaying whatever action they take and potentially they're gonna lose half of those cards that they just traded for with you when the sevens rolled. While buying development cards is certainly a valid strategy to actually winning and often key to a late stage game, Early on, you should always prioritize your resource production, which means saving those cards for upgrading to cities. Remember that there are two points for longest road and largest army. And if you're already at eight points, this is the sneakiest way of jumping to the win without people noticing. You can hide your strategy somewhat, uh, and perhaps you give the impression that you're just trying to get the bits for a new town and being unlucky, but then bam, on your turn, you lay down three roads at once, grab the longest road and you win. For that reason, never deliberately go for longest road early on in the game. Even if you can, it's just not worth it. Keep your road separated. You'll just be painting a target on yourself for what are very liquid points that can be stolen away at a moment's notice. If you don't need those two points, don't take them. Finally, you should never trade with the winning player if they're at seven or more points. It's just universally stupid. They potentially need just one or two cards to win the game at that point. And if you're the player that does the game winning trade for them, shame on you, that was entirely your fault. Now these strategies assume a few things, but most importantly is that everyone is playing to win and there's neutral group dynamics. One of the biggest problems with Catan is that it's very easy to play Kingmaker, i.e. allowing someone else to win if you've given up or perhaps just with something as simple as a couple playing at the table who want to help each other as much as possible. It will really unbalance the game if they're constantly you know, doing favorable trades to each other. So you'll need to mitigate that and ensure that everyone knows that's not allowed. Either play to win or don't play. If that is a problem that your group is going to face, you're gonna to have to look at different games that don't have a trading mechanism at all, uh, because that's always gonna be ripe for abuse. Anyway, that's it for me. Good luck and don't forget that there are plenty of digital platforms that Catan is available on from Switch to Xbox Live, 
to Steam. So that's a great way to put into practice some of these strategies before your next uh, real life game. Hit like if you appreciate these tips and consider subscribing for more board games reviews from me, James Bruce, here on Tabletop Dungeon. Until next time.